a good morning, uh, or whatever time of day it is where you happen to be in the world. Uh, this is Dr. Tom Wood. I'm the epidemiologist with Samaritan's Purse. And it's my privilege today to welcome you to the Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope that you all uh, will participate in our conversation today, and if you'll look over to the right-hand side of your screen there, you will see that there's a chat window, a chat box, and if you have questions that come up or or can, you know, during the presentation, uh, then I would ask you if you would type it in there, then I can moderate those and get those to our guest speaker. And our, our guest speaker today is Dr. Mary Taylor. Uh, Dr. Taylor is a, uh, a graduate of the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Uh, she's board certified in pediatrics, pediatric cardiology, and pediatric critical care. And she also holds a master's degree in clinical investigation from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Faye Taylor found her passion in perioperative cardiac critical care after her fellowship at the Boston Children's Hospital. In 2011, she moved to Mississippi and developed and co-directed a congenital heart program at the University uh, Mississippi Medical Center. She currently serves as the Division Chief of Pediatric Cardiology and pediatric critical care at UMMC and provides strategic guidance for the Children's Hospital. She's been a member of the Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care Society since its inception and she's a board liaison for critical care. Dr. Taylor has been uh, on the leadership team for an you know, annual cardiac surgery mission trip to Kenya uh, with Samaritan's Purse for the past six years and uh, today as you I uh, read the announcement that came out. Her um, presentation is going to be on pediatric heart surgery in East Africa as relates to uh, rheumatic heart disease and congenital heart disease. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to you, uh, Mary. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I guess I need to see the first slides that are coming up. Okay, there you go. Um, we started this mission trip to uh, Tenwick Hospital in East Africa. It's in Kenya, um, in Bomet, Kenya. It's about two and a half hours drive from Nairobi. Um, one of my colleagues in pediatric cardiology um, was actually a medical uh, medical student with a person who lives there in Tenwick and is a surgeon there and there's a large population of patients with rheumatic heart disease in Africa um, in all of sub-Saharan Africa and we'll talk about that a bit. Um, this hospital was started um, by a pediatrician, Dr. Ernie Story, and you can change the slide. It's a, a mission hospital. Their motto is we treat and Jesus heals and they really are true to that mission and have been in practice there for about 30 plus years. Um, the hospital, you can go ahead and change the slide, um, the person in the, with the light on his forehead is, um, a, uh, pediat is a general surgeon who works there at Tenwick and he um, has worked in partnership with us to build this program to provide um, heart surgery for children. Initially we started the program looking at children with rheumatic heart disease and trying to um, provide surgery there and in the course of that have developed a full service operation providing um, congenital heart surgery as well. Change slide. Um, so rheumatic heart disease, uh, the global burden in children and young adults um, is very, very high. There are about 233,000 deaths annually and about 15.6 million people are currently affected. Um, largely rheumatic heart disease has been eradicated in this country, um, in the United States. Um, but is quite prevalent there and pretty much every patient that you see has some degree of impact from rheumatic heart disease. Um, it's very prominent in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Central Asia, the Pacific and in some places in Australia and New Zealand. So this is just a, a specimen of a heart showing you in the center of the picture there is a thickened valve. The leaflets of the heart should be very paper thin leaflets and the um, 
when a patient is exposed to streptococcal infection, the infection can involve the heart valves and the valves become very thickened and you can imagine that it makes the valves really non-functional to allow blood to pass through the heart as it's supposed to. Next slide. So this is actually a valve that has been taken out of a patient. We're putting in an artificial valve in the place of this. And if you show the next slide, I have my fingertip in the valve. That just shows the, the amount of opening of that valve. This came out of a child who was um, in his late teens, and that should be widely open. The valve should be um, paper-thin leaflets that open fully to allow blood to go through the heart. And I'll show a little diagram in a few minutes that explains that a little further. So the Mission Hospital, when you get there, we take our entire team of people to do this cardiac surgery. It's quite an endeavor. We take about 18 to 20 people. They include cardiologists, critical care doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners. We have a, um, a biomedical engineer that helps us maintain the equipment and monitors that we need, perfusionist, um, anesthesiologist. It's a large team. And you drive it from Nairobi, as I mentioned, to Tenwick Mission Hospital, which is in a um, rural part of Africa. Next slide. Um, it's a beautiful area with it's a tea growing region, fairly mountainous. When I first went there, I was kind of surprised to see how lush um, and green it is. Next slide. And this is, shows an overview. Samaritan's Purse came and filmed our um, group when we were there a couple of years ago and did a, a documentary about the congenital heart program. Um, and they had a GoPro camera and one of their photographers took this photograph. Um, this shows the campus of Tenwick Hospital. It's quite a large hospital that's associated with a nursing school. Um, there's a chaplaincy school and there's also a medical school, I mean a residency program. Their residents live on this campus and um, we spend a good bit of our time trying to help educate the nurses and the residents so that they can start providing some of this care themselves in the future and they're currently doing so. Next slide. So this is part of our team arriving on campus. Um, uh, we have drivers that bring us over from Nairobi and the person in the, on the left is a, a nurse that came with us. We have multiple nurses. As I said, we usually um, have about 18 to 20 people on our team. Next. Um, we took, when we first went there, we take tours of the hospital, but this is just give you an example of the type of facilities. It's a very uh, well-maintained hospital. Um, this is their waiting area for, their, um, for some of their clinics. Next. Um, their casualty is their emergency department. And um, the, person, the man going through the door is actually uh, Ben Roberts. He is a PDI, I'm an ophthalmologist, excuse me, from Birmingham, Alabama, and he lives there on the Tenwick campus um, and does an extraordinary job taking care of people with ophthalmologic problems. Um, next, they have tiny babies that are, this is the equivalent of their neonatal intensive care unit. You can see the light at the end of the box is providing heat for the baby. Um, you know, unfortunately, they don't have a lot of resources as far as maintenance of tiny, small babies, and we have a limitation of the size of the babies that we can do heart surgery, but it's um, pretty dramatic, you know, how many patients do actually do well, and they, um, even this tiny, premature baby, um, as long as they don't have a lot of ventilatory needs or um, complex needs, they can do quite well. So this is us setting up our makeshift ICU. We turned their um, recovery area from their operating room into an ICU. The man walking across is a biomedical engineer. He's helping us with the monitoring setup. Um, the girl on the on the right with the pigtail is a um, a nurse from Vanderbilt Hospital. She's gone for every one of the missions that we've come to Tenwick and is kind of our leader of, from the nursing standpoint. We bring a lot of the supplies ourselves, including a lot of the medications that we need for the post-operative care. Um, as you can imagine, doing heart surgery in the United States is a challenging um, endeavor. Um, it takes a huge team of people, even here, and a very large number of resources and um, can be very complex, especially in the post-operative period. Um, we're trying to choose patients that can recover relatively quickly and can have a full recovery um, and not need future surgery. So some of the operations that we do in this country, we don't do there because we would need subsequent operations. We want children who um, 
have a repairable lesion um, and can leave, lead full and healthy lives after um, we're finished with the operation. Next. Uh, this again is our ICU. We um, again bring monitors. We have echo machines and all types of equipment that we bring over. You can go to the next slide. Um, and one of the big pieces that we do is perfusion. This person is a perfusionist. Um, and they, we set up a supply closet and maintain a good bit of our equipment there in, um, at the hospital so that we'll have it for subsequent trips. We've now begun building a, other teams from other institutions. Our team largely came from Vanderbilt um, Medical Center and we've now kind of dispersed across the country. But there's a team that is being formed from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. There's a, a team that comes from Mayo Clinic, for example. Um, there's different teams from um, across and from Maine, um, actually. And the, the different teams that come and we leave some equipment and supplies there. The perfusion is a form of heart-lung bypass that's required to do heart surgeries. Um, we are training the Kenyan staff to do these, this part of the procedure while we're not there. Dr. Russ White, who lives on the campus, is doing some of the valve replacements and their team is quite skilled at providing the care. So our perfusionists work with their team um, to continue ongoing education and have them actively involved in kind of all parts of the operation. You next. This is um, me in, in the, one of the supply rooms. This is some of their ventilatory equipment. Um, as you can imagine, the resources are fairly limited and they reuse quite a bit of their equipment. That's not something we normally do in the United States. and We have a fairly wasteful environment and throw things away and don't reuse them, but these are um, not, you know, they're used for multiple patients and um, they have their own system of maintaining things and it's, it, it works quite well. Next. Um, again, this is the ICU as it's kind of set up and you can start seeing patients there in the background. You, one of the challenges, uh, the, you, know, you can't really take anything for granted when you're kind of in the field doing um, these types of things. Um, it's a kind of a given in our hospitals in the United States that when you have oxygen piped into the hospital that it's going to be oxygen coming out of the wall at all times. Their oxygen, um, they have an oxygen concentrator there on campus um, and they strive to maintain you know, adequate supply of oxygen. We kind of take, do our toll on that for these operations because the, uh, the heart-lung bypass machine also requires oxygen going to it and plus we're doing more complex, longer procedures. So the oxygen um, capacity can be kind of limited at times. Um, we um, kind of are mindful of this and they have staff there on, that are helping with this throughout the time we're there. But I thought this was a little bit funny that to call if it's less than 80, we would be calling quite a bit because it's usually less than 80, but it seems to work quite well despite um, those limitations. So we see patients in clinic and we arrange um, some of their staff there that's on campus arrange for the clinic patients to be there when we arrive so that we can start screening patients. Um, so these are two young children and their mothers that have come to be screened. In general, we screen probably um, on the order of 100 patients and choose about 20 patients. We operate for two weeks and we do about two operations a day, Monday through Friday. So we can do up to 20 to 25 patients um, in the course of our time there. Um, and we might screen 100 to 150 patients to pick those 20 patients that are going to have the best chance of a good outcome. We want patients that are sick enough that um, they uh, need surgery kind of immediately, but not so sick that they're not going to recover well in the time that we have to be there. We don't want to leave critical patients kind of, you know, there when we leave. So we have a little bit of preparation time and a little time that we stay at the end of our trip to kind of help them through that. This is Dr. Mike Liskey, so I think he might be online somewhere listening in. He is um, kind of the founder of this program. He and Dr. White, who was, uh, were trained, trained together in school in medicine, and um, he is a cardiologist, pediatric cardiologist in Tennessee, 
and he, he comes every year, helps orchestrate the whole um, trip, including all the travel and coordinating all the people that need to be there. Um, he screens patients with another cardiologist in clinic, and they see, as it said, up to 100, 150 patients, even to select the patients. Um, we have meetings every day that we're there to go through the patients that they've seen in clinic and kind of screen and pick, you know, select the patients that are going to get operations. We sometimes take gifts for the patients. We took um, several soccer balls, like 100 soccer balls, to give to the children that we see in clinic as a, um, a gift. Many of the children do not need operations at this time, or they have a condition that someone expressed concern about, but they were able to be cleared and said, you know, they can go you know, don't have anything that needs any care. Some of them need some medications to maintain and we can schedule them to come back and see us the next time we're there if they need any future surgical intervention. I'm going to move into a few of the types of lesions that we operate on. This little baby came to us, this was a couple of years ago, this little baby, um, I believe he was uh, five or six months old. He has a condition called truncus arteriosus. You can see his lips are quite blue. His tongue, if he stuck his tongue out, his tongue is a little bit dusky. Um, this is a condition that would have been operated on in the first week or two of life if he were in the United States. Um, and it's quite remarkable that he looks so healthy and well despite having this condition. But certainly it's something that he would not have a long life if it weren't repaired. Um, the I'll show briefly about normal anatomy. So, it, kind of the easiest way to think about it is to tracing trace the path of the red blood cell through the heart. So, pretending you're a blood cell, and you're going to come back to the right side of the heart, which is on the left side of your screen. Go through a one-way valve out to the pulmonary artery that takes blood to the lungs, and then come back from the lungs with oxygen in it and pump it out to the aorta, the kind of crook-shaped vessel that's exiting the heart. Next slide. So this is a picture of truncus arteriosus. So the blue blood is the unoxygenated blood that's coming back to the right atrium and going through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. The red blood is coming out of the lungs with oxygen in it and it's going to the left ventricle. And in truncus arteriosus, instead of having two distinct valves coming out of each side of the heart, um, the pulmonary artery from the right and the aorta from the left, there's one trunk that is a persistence of a um, fetal structure that everybody has when the infant is forming. Um, and in truncus, that one, the vessel fails to divide into the two arteries. So you have all the blood mixing together, pumped out that one vessel, and the blood has a choice of either going to the body or going to the lungs. Next picture. And you can, this is an echo picture that kind of shows that same um, situation. So the RV is the right ventricle, left LV is left ventricle. Um, it shows this VSD or ventricular septal defect that's kind of um, overriding the truncal valve that is pointed there with the abnormal truncal valve. And that's just one um, large vessel coming out of the heart. Next slide. These are just a picture cartoon of the different types of truncus. Um, the type 1 is the most typical um, type and that's the top left picture. Um, and again, that the goal of the operation is to close the hole between the two pumping chambers and to separate these two vessels. So take that pulmonary artery off the aorta and then put a connection from the right ventricle to that pulmonary artery. Next slide. So here's a cartoon showing that so that the truncal valve now becomes the aortic valve. And then you have that tubed Gore-Tex or a piece of um, homograft or a donor graft that connects the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery to take blood to the lungs. So after this operation, the patient's circulations are, are separated and they're fairly, you know, pretty much a normal um, circulation. So this is a great example of something that um, is repaired. Um, it's not a palliated operation. That person wouldn't need future operations other than to follow up to make sure that they don't have any narrowing of that conduit over time. Um, but for the most part, this would be a repaired, um, a, bit, a repaired operation. Next slide. So some of the things that we're concerned about in doing this operation is mostly pulmonary hypertension. So the, the lungs have been exposed to high pressure and over circulation or extra blood going to the lungs. Um, 
especially if this is repaired late in infancy. As you can imagine, this baby is five or six months old, so for six months, a lot of extra blood is going out to the lungs. The lungs are kind of getting beat up, so to speak. Um, the blood vessels in the lungs become thickened and develop um, propensity to have pulmonary hypertension. Um, in our country, in the United States, we would operate on this child certainly within the first month of life, usually in the first couple of weeks, um, so that this lessens the risk of having pulmonary hypertension, and even still patients can have that. And we have some things here um, that we can provide to patients in the United States that aren't available in Kenya, some mechanical support like something called ECMO. Nitric oxide is a drug that you can inhale. It's quite expensive, and it's something that we use in this country. Um, and, but our options are quite limited there. We can't really extend the period that we keep them anesthetized because it, we have limited resources to care for the next patient. So we have to um, really choose wisely and be very careful in the post-operative care. Next slide. Um, so again, other things are things like low output. That, so if the heart kind of struggles sometimes after heart surgery, um, and in general, we in this country might leave the chest open for a few days, leave the patient on bypass support or ECMO for a few days, but this isn't something that's really an option in Kenya. So uh, again, it's careful patient selection is kind of the mantra that we live by. Next. Um, there are some possibilities of having some residual problems after this operation. Um, we do transesophageal echo um, during the procedure. So Dr. Liskey would come to the operating room, do a special kind of echo to look and see is there any leakage of the valve that is now the new aortic valve or the neo-aortic valve. If there's any narrowing or leakage of that valve that might require um, more surgery, any residual connection or hole between the two pumping chambers. All those things are very important to maintain good post-operative care, and those things we would go back in right away and fix those if there was a problem. Next. And so this is that same little boy after his operation. Here you can see him. This is, I think, the first post-operative day, which is quite unusual in our country. We, he would be on a ventilator for quite some time, but these are very resilient um, children. We usually get them off the ventilator very quickly. You can see his tongue is nice, nice and pink. His circulation is back to normal and he should live a, a healthy, active life. This is a picture in the operating room before the procedure. This shows that we do um, stop and have a prayer immediately before the operation in the operating room, praying for the, for the skill of the team, pay, praying for the patient and for the patient's family. Um, we have nurses and specialists that are participating in learning the um, the care that we provide, include, and residents and physicians. The woman in the pink scrubs that you can see in the, the flowered kind of hat is actually a surgical um, resident who is now an attending that lives there in Tenwick. She is going to be trained in pediatric surgery and then hopefully in pediatric congenital heart surgery. Um, and is she is, her name is Agneta. She is a uh, outstanding resource to us has been quite, um, she's very, very skilled and I'm sure she will be very successful as a pediatric congenital surgeon. She works with our surgeon who in this case was Dr. Reed Quinn who is from Maine and um, they work together so that she is trained to do the operations. Next. So this is kind of a busy operating room um, and you can see coming in the door is the perfusionist, some of the staff preparing in the background, the anesthesiologist getting the patient prepared for surgery, and in the foreground is the heart-lung bypass machine that is used um, for the perfusion during the case. And next. You can see it's kind of hectic here. They are putting the patient on bypass. Um, the, the person in the green scrubs in the foreground is actually a Kenyan person who's learning um, the perfusion technique, which is quite complicated, um, and the person squatting down is, is working with him. Um, again, anesthesia um, and the surgery and nurses, and you know, we kind of work hand in hand with our Kenyan partners there. Next. Um, we kind of come freely in and out of the operating room to kind of observe. We have people, kind of, um, you, have, you see in the far right there's an echo screen. You see the transesophageal echo that the cardiologist is performing and we evaluate to see that the heart 
um, operation went as planned and we think everything will go well and they, the child will be able to come off bypass and um, be ready to go to the, uh, to the recovery unit. Next. Um, this again is Agneta on the left who is learning to do surgery. Dr. Ali Dodge Katami is on the right. He is actually from Mississippi and one of my partners. He went um, a few a couple of years ago. Um, and these are kind of close up pictures and the intensity of this um, procedure. Once the operation starts, um, in general, the operations take anywhere from three to five hours for the operation itself. It's quite intense and the clock is ticking and we try to do it as quickly as possible to minimize any kind of long-term effects of having been on the bypass machine. Right, next. Um, so this is a picture of the, the tubing that is placed inside to, to do the heart-lung bypass. Um, it's again quite an intricate procedure. Um, you can see it's a small opening. The baby's heart is the size of a baby's fist. So you can imagine uh, it's about the size of a walnut um, and you know these, the blood vessels that they are rearranging and sewing to are quite small, um, certainly smaller than a pencil, um, about you know six to eight millimeters um, for the aorta um, in some small baby. Um, so it's quite intricate operation that we're doing on um, small, tedious structures. Next. The child is then brought um, through those double doors into our recovery area. Um, we spend time teaching the, res the nurses to do the immediate post-operative care. So someone's charting, someone's doing the assessments, they're working hand in hand with our nurses um, so that they can learn to um, provide the, the post-operative care for patients, particularly those with rheumatic heart disease, teenagers and young adults that they can operate on when we're not there doing the infant surgeries. This is a baby after surgery. We've taken him off the breathing machine. Um, you can see the incision on his chest, the chest tubes, and we have kind of made a makeshift, what we, could, we would call CPAP here, is allowing him to have kind of positive pressure to breathe with, through that bag. Um, this is something we've kind of pieced together. They don't have a CPAP machine, but this is kind of transition someone off the ventilator um, if they're struggling after um, after coming off the, the breathing machine. You know, sometimes you have to be creative and innovative um, to work with the tools that you have and it actually works quite well. Next. Uh, we have families that have, some of them have even walked from across um, Africa to come, you know, from far distances to come and be evaluated for surgery. Um, some of them have come from Nairobi with a, a group that screens patients there and brings them to us. The people of many different cultures and different languages. Um, yeah, I don't speak Swahili. I wish I spoke Swahili. I can recognize a few words. Um, they all wake up and want water, maji, um, and you know they really don't request much in the way of pain medications. Um, we take. Um, those, that little pillow and we have some groups in the United States that make some blankets and such that we give to them and they can hold those and um, cough and that kind of helps support their chest. Um, we take you know great pride in trying to provide kind of family centered care. We have a chaplain that comes with us that spends time or it comes from Samaritan's Purse and actually now there's a chaplain that lives there on the campus um, and they spend time with the families while we're in the operating room to help give them some support. Um, until the operation is over and it's, as you can imagine, quite a complicated thing to explain what we're doing to people that we really can't speak their language but we draw pictures and, and spend some time with them with interpreters and try to help them understand what the child's going through. So these are, after the operation, this is a, I think the first post-operative day for this little guy and you can see he's having his chai tea. Um, and that would be quite unusual here to have someone sitting up drinking tea the first day after operation. So it's just so remarkable to us to see the miraculous recovery that these children can have after um, this type of operation. The nurse Rebecca is has been coming with us for quite some time, um, and Dr. Andy Smith in the foreground is a pediatric cardiologist who also comes from Vanderbilt. Um, these are some of the other um, Kenyan team, the operating room team. They are 
function as anesthetist and perfusionist and this little guy um, is recovering and ready to go to the floor. He had rheumatic heart disease and was really on death's door when we were there. Um, was very tenuous start of his operation and just did remarkably well. Uh, again, it's kind of a busy time when the patients first come out of the operating room. There's quite a bit of, of work to do to get them settled and situated. Um, and again, it takes a whole team of people. And you can see as the cases go by during the week, patients kind of line up and we have three or four patients in the ICU uh, throughout the remainder of the week. Next. We take um, kind of different kinds of tools to do what we would do in this country, incentive spirometry it's called, to kind of help keep their lungs inflated. We take these little toy flutes and bubbles and anything we can think of to help encourage them to take good deep breaths. Um, you can see this little guy blowing on the um, little recorder. Next. Another condition that is uh, fairly common for us to see in the clinic is Tetralogy of Fellow. It's a long word that means um, just kind of named after someone named Fellow. Tetralogy means there are four um, lesions associated with that. Um, and I'll show a picture of kind of what that is. But basically children that have not enough blood flow going to their lungs and some mixing of the blood with a hole between the two pumping chambers. Um, and this is something that would normally be um, have some type of operation, usually early in infancy. Sometimes patients don't require anything until they're six or seven months of age, but most require something by a year of age. They would have had a, a complete repair. Next. So a typical chest x-ray of someone with this condition has um, what we call boot-shaped heart. So the, the point part of the apex of the heart is kind of upturned, and then they have a, a decreased amount of blood flow going to the lungs. Next. Um, so this is a cartoon diagram. It shows the purple blood just um, implies that the blood is all mixed together. So the oxygenated and unoxygenated blood is mixed. It comes back and there's a muscle bundle below the pulmonary artery that's taking blood to the lungs. And it's restricting the blood that's going to the lungs. Um, it make it hard for blood to get there. The valve is narrowed and below the valve is narrowed. And there's a hole between the two pumping chambers. So blood will take a path of least resistance and go uh, from right to left across the aortic valve so the patient will be quite blue when that muscle spasms. Next. Here's a picture, a dye picture of that muscle spasm. So on the bottom right there's dye um, in the right ventricle or right pumping chamber and it should be a wide open connection to the arteries going to the lungs and instead you can see it's kind of pinched off there. Um, as that muscle this bundle has kind of spasmed below that valve. It kind of limits the amount of blood flow that can go to the um, lungs. So when you listen to a child with tetralogy of flow, you hear a very loud murmur and sometimes it's called a thrill. You can feel the buzzing of the blood going across that narrowed valve. Um, usually some EKG changes from the right ventricle getting very thick and hypertrophied from um, trying to pump against a, a thickened valve. I mentioned the boot-shaped heart with low pulmonary blood flow to the lungs. And sometimes children have what's called TET spells, or spells where the oxygenation is very, very low, that muscle spasms, um, they have very little blood going to their lungs, so not much blood can come back from the lungs to pump out to the body, and the patient would eventually faint. Um, these type of spells are, are fairly common in older children um, with tetralogy of flow, but again, in this country, we tend to repair children earlier um, and certainly in, in the first year or two of life and the children that we're seeing there in Kenya are in their teens with Tetralogy of Flow. So a lot of times the children will um, come up with their own way of, of taking care of a TET spell. Um, if they squat to the ground, for example, it increases the resistance of blood to go to the body and kind of forces blood to go out to the lungs. And so they kind of um, intrinsically kind of learn these techniques to help get extra blood to their lungs. So this is after the child is repaired. They would patch the hole between the two lower chambers, patch open the artery going out to the lungs, um, and you would have separation of the circulation and the person would be repaired. And that right pumping chamber is quite thickened, usually from having pumped against that narrowing for a period of time. So um, there's a, some risk of their um, that ventricle just kind of failing or not being able to, to do the work because it's had this pop off through that 
hole between the two lower chambers. Sometimes we leave a little extra hole between the two upper chambers um, to help in the immediate post-operative period. But surprisingly, for the most part, children do quite well after repairing this. So this little guy had a tetralogy repair, um, and he did quite well. This is in the um, in the clinic area, I mean, I'm sorry, the ward area, after they leave the ICU, they go to an open ward. You can see kind of beds lined up there, um, patients of different um, illnesses and different conditions. Um, and he's there. We continue to follow them once they're on the floor and until they're ready to go home. This is an infant who also, I think, had Tetralogy of Flow. Um, you can see, you know, this is immediately or you know within the first 24 hours after surgery which is really quite uh, astounding considering in this country patients are usually in an intensive care unit sedated on a ventilator for several days after this type of procedure. Next. One of our missions is to teach um, the people there so we give talks and um, some about emergency response, um, life support kind of techniques. Um, some specific to recovery after heart surgery, specific to rhythm problems, for example. Um, and these are some of the nursing students. Um, we've now built a relationship with them such that they have assigned certain nurses to come to be with us throughout the time we're there so they can really get some more intensive education. Um, and we have some nurses that come back every year to work with us each time. And they're very, very skilled and really need very little of our help now in doing some of the post-operative recovery. Next. Um, this little guy um, was operated on a couple of years ago. He actually wants to be a doctor, and he came back to visit us this past time when we were, we were here. And again, he's pretty freshly post-op um, and doing very well after his surgery. We um, have a fund that t-shirt says Hearts of East Africa. Um, we have a, a nonprofit fund that we um, have people donate to for Hearts of East Africa and we are able to support um, the patients that have no uh, funding source. The hospital does require them to pay a, uh, what's a large amount of money to them but really is quite a small amount of money um, considering the types of procedures they're having done but some people aren't even able to um, pay that so we um, have the funds to support um, the needs of the patients that that we have chosen to have surgery so um, they bring some of their own resources and then we supplement them to be able to um, take care of all the cases that we need to do some people are not quite so happy after they've had their operation. This person, this little girl was a little bit grouchy right afterwards, but um, by the end they're running outside and playing and, and look quite well before they go home. The next case that we're going to talk about is um, called um, atrioventricular septal defect or AV canal. This child has Down syndrome, which is uh, not uncommon um, genetic syndrome when you have three um, chromosome 21s um, and this lesion is this syndrome is very highly associated with a condition called atrioventricular septal defect or AV canal. Next slide. So um, atrioventricular septal defect means that there's basically one common upper chamber or atria and one common ventricle. So there's a large hole between the upper chambers, a hole between the lower chambers. And so the blood can flow to and fro um, between those chambers. And in general, as I mentioned before, the blood takes a path of least resistance. So there'll be quite a bit of blood going to the lungs. Um, this condition is usually repaired or um, at least restrict the amount of blood flow going to the lungs early on and generally it's repaired in the first few months of life um, because you, we, you know, with time if there's excessive blood flow going to the lungs, the lungs will develop pulmonary hypertension and children with Down syndrome are at particularly high risk for this and if it's not repaired in a timely way they will have irreversible pulmonary hypertension even after the repair is, um, is completed. Um, so the first 24 hours after surgery is usually pretty um, touch and go because um, you know the, there's some degree of leakage of those valves. You have to 
put a patch between the two upper chambers, a patch between the two lower chambers, and then attach, reattach the two AV valves to that patch. So those can leak some. Um, in general, we try to keep the patients sedated um, and with you know not a lot of volume inside the heart in the first 24 hours. Um, and those are all kind of touchy things that we monitor a lot of um, different pressures when they're here in this country. We have kind of limited time um, uh, on a ventilator in Africa and limited numbers of medications that we can use to support the patient. So um, we have to have very careful monitoring of the amount of blood that is in the heart, the filling of the heart, and those types of things. Pulmonary hypertension, I've mentioned, is, is very likely, especially if it's a late repair um, and higher incidence in Down syndrome. Next. Um, so this is, a, all patients with AV canal don't necessarily have um, uh, Down syndrome. Um, also, we can also have patients that have just the VSD or the lower chamber that has a hole between the two lower chambers. Next. Again, we bring um, balls and toys and things to the children to give them little prizes after surgery. And in, in general, the children are up and uh, running around soon afterwards. We usually bring um, quite a bit of equipment I've mentioned already, but um, each person on our team brings two large duffel bags full of a limited amount of their clothing, but for the most part, supplies. You can see um, just in front of, just aside the bed is the chest tube um, container, for example. They're pretty large items that we have to pack into duffel bags and bring enough to do all um, 20 or 24 operations. Right, next. Um, the surgeon on the right is Dr. Brett Mettler. He is actually at Vanderbilt, and he's come with us a couple of times on the um, on the trip. Um, and we spend time, you know, bonding with the patients before and after, um, praying with the patients and the families before. Um, and it's just the most rewarding experience to see how quickly they'll recover and um, just to imagine what this child will be able to do as a healthy adult. Next. Um, some of the things that this is kind of sticking with their kind of cultural um, systems. This little guy refused to use the bathroom in the in the ICU. He wanted to go outside and use the bathroom. So this is probably one of the first times that we've I've seen somebody escorted outside to use the bathroom with the um, <laughs> take, kicking his chest tube in tow. This is kind of in the middle of the night, and you can see it's dark outside. Uh, you know, we provide care 24/7 when we're there. So, a physician, nurses, nurse practitioners, that we're there all night long in the ICU with them. Next, um, again, this is uh, another picture in the operating room. Um, it's a lot of complex instruments. We take some of the instruments with us. Those perfusion pumps that are on the right, Dr. Bob Groom has been on a number of trips. Um, he is a perfusionist, and he's in the red cap on the on the right. Um, uh, the perfusion equipment is very, very complicated with lots of tubing packs and things that have to be shipped from the United States, and he's helped us um, get those there for them, and they have some equipment that they keep there, like that perfusion machine itself, and the biomed has to work to maintain that and make sure that it's working properly when we get there, because that's sustaining the patient while they're operating on the inside of the heart. Okay, next. Um, one thing that we've embarked on since starting the um, program is doing some catheter-based um, interventions. So rather than having a full-fledged operation, the cardiologist, the tall gentleman in the green, um, in the green gown, is Dr. Tom Doyle from Vanderbilt. He's an interventional cardiologist. So some of the procedures we can balloon open a narrowed valve, for example. Um, we have to kind of make a makeshift. Um, means of doing so because they don't have the same type of equipment that we have to be able to do video monitoring while we're doing the procedure, which you have to be able to play back to make the measurements to determine the size of the balloons, etc. Um, so on the left you see Dr. Liskey and you see someone with a camera. We're um, videotaping some of the um, x-ray pictures so that we could play it back and make measurements. But this has allowed us to do some non-invasive, more minimally invasive procedures while we're there and extends 
um, our care so that we can do the 20 operations plus four or five um, catheter-based interventions at the same time. Next. Um, this is actually my husband who goes on the trip sometimes and he's a, kind of a uh, extra pair of hands and he was doing running the video camera and helping with some of the measurements in the operating room um, doing the um, to enable us to do these complex procedures. In our country here we would have a special fluoro machine that has playback capabilities that they just don't have there at this time. Um, we have had this is Dr. Liskey uh, watching me trying to do electronic medical records. They added that in the last couple of years so the, their system is kind of coming along and tracking behind our systems here in this country. We use kind of um, uh, non uh, you know, paperless system, so they have gone to electronic charting. That's what we're, do we're doing there. Again, this is the recovery ward after the operations. You can see the families and children, their mosquito nets hanging there, and they have some adult patients in that area, but for the most part, they have them separated by children um, in some adult wards and pediatric kind of wards. Before we go home, we check up on the patients and ensure that they're doing well and ready to be discharged. They will have some follow-up um, with the, um, in the clinic there, usually with Dr. Agnetta, the person I, I showed you earlier, um, but they will have some follow-up. There's a cardiologist and some people in Nairobi that see some of the patients and follow-up, and then we follow up some of the patients when we go back to the subsequent trip each year. Uh, this little guy is ready to go home before we leave. Um, we like to go say goodbye. Uh, you know, next slide. I mentioned that Samaritan's Purse was there filming a documentary. These are the their film crew that was there, um, and the mom and little baby is about to have surgery, um, and have someone interpreting um, for her and explaining kind of the impact of having this operation done for her child. If the ch child does not get heart surgery in a timely way, most times they don't grow very well, they're very thin and frail, um, have poor exercise tolerance, and in general, um, you know, would not have a, a complete um, lifespan anticipated. Um, we're trying to choose operations that once they're repaired, they should expect to have a full recovery. Next. This is the little guy that we operated on um, is planning to be a doctor. He's telling us goodbye, learning some little peace sign. Next. This is some of our team, and we take a kind of going away picture with all the, these are kind of one week's worth of our patients. Um, Dr. Don Moore on the right is another cardiologist in that picture. All right, next. And this is our team this past year. This is a, one of our other weeks of, um, of patients that we took care of um, with some of the nurses. And we took them outside and take a picture before um, they're discharged. And again, um, with the striped shirt is Dr. Russ White. And he is um, the chief surgeon there on the campus at Tenwick. And he um, is able to continue to do some of the um, heart valve repairs um, on older children. In general, the children over the age of 13 or 14, or, you know, maybe 15, um, can have surgery there when we are not there. Now that we've trained their team, and then we can reserve the younger children to be done when we come back. Right, next, this is a little guy um, who came back to clinic to see us. Um, and Dr. Liskey would see some patients in clinic and follow up and ensure they don't need any other further medications, repeat their echocardiogram, et cetera. Next. Um, I just threw this in there. We, on our way home, we sometimes um, see some other parts of the community. Um, some of our patients do have some challenges with their um, response to surgeries because of their lungs. They live in these small, um, many of them live in these small homes that have a very small window that you can barely see in that picture, but they cook inside that home. You see the pots and pans and the fire um, pit there. So they have a lot of smoke inhalation, and so their lungs are not perfectly healthy, um, and sometimes this does impact their immediate recovery, and we have to take these things into consideration. And there's another picture of their uh, the home, um, that they types of homes that they live in. All right, 
And I think these last couple of slides are just some other scenes from Africa and you know, the miracle of what we do is really um, pretty impressive that we've been able to accomplish this, I think, so far. And we're excited every year to go back. It's kind of the highlight of our, of our year. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedder, for a fascinating talk. Uh, yeah, um, I've been in Africa a lot, and just, I love the children there. And to see those pictures of children that are before and after is very rewarding, I'm sure, for you. Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, one of the questions we have come in is from, I, I believe it's a Skip Roy. He's a physical therapist. Uh, he said he's been to 10 weeks before. Mm -hmm. But he wonders if there's any role for post-operation rehabilitation with these patients. I think that's a great point. That's, um, it certainly would be something that would be very helpful. Some of the patients are quite debilitated when they have their operations. You can imagine if they've um, not had surgery that would have been you know, really required in the first few months of life and they're several years old. Um, they have quite a bit of limitations. They've had poor exercise tolerance, so a lot of them are, have muscle wasting and what we call failure to thrive. Um, so I think early rehabilitation and, and working with the families to show them kind of ways that they can optimize their care after they go home, it certainly would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I noticed during your presentation you said that uh, in spite of the number of times you've been there, you've picked up some Swahili, but not mm -hmm. much. Uh, having, <laughs> having spent the time in Africa, we started out with a three-month uh, trip uh, when the back in '92, when the Somali crisis was going on, and uh, it, it, you deal not only with Swahili; it's the major language. Right. But uh, yeah. you said you had patients coming from all over Africa, so language becomes a problem. But uh, how do you uh, manage that? Well, you know, the nurses that are there on campus and some of the residents on campus are actually from different places all over Africa. So many of them know some of the other um, languages and the, and the, the dialects. There, um, you know, some of the Maasai people are there. There are people from the Congo. There are people from all over, and they have different dialects um, and different languages. And many of the nurses are very, very helpful with that. The parents can be very helpful. The children themselves are very, very helpful because they are learning some English in their school, um, and most of them have some ability to understand at least what we're saying and, and can be helpful. Um, we have people that um, live there at the Tenwick campus that have um, experience with that also and can help us interpret. I can imagine that uh, you know one of your major um, rewards is just seeing the outcome with these children. But I think that people who would might be considering you know about that kind of service uh, might be interested in what you consider your major challenges that you seek to put together a team to go do that. Mm -hmm. I think the major challenge in constructing the team, you know, obviously we don't. We don't have a shortage of people that want to do it. I think that's fantastic. Um, we have very passionate Christian people who are really eager to be helpful and to um, apply their skills in a different area of the country. Um, I think teaching is a really important thing, part of what we're doing. Um, I think one of the big challenges is getting all the equipment that is necessary and getting the, the funds to be able to take care of all the patients that we want to care for. The screening is a big part of it, and so being able to have the, um, the support systems to do that, to have the equipment that functions well. We take some of our equipment with us, but there's always a chance that the equipment malfunctions or you know, there's some problem, that, hence we bring the biomedical person with us. But you know, I think that's you know, the biggest problem is having you know, getting everything there. Now that we've been doing it for some time, we have some systems in place and we know the system and it's very, um, fairly seamless now that we've got some equipment that we can leave there. I think having some communication with their people who live at their campus, other um, groups come and use some of the equipment that we've left and so we need kind of a means of categorizing or um, uh, you know, keeping track of all the equipment that we've left there and the medications that we've left there. Um, there's sometimes a communication gap trying to know what all is there in preparation for the next trip. So that's been a little bit of a challenge. But um, for the most part, 
you know, God has miraculous ways of working these things out, and we get there, and there are patients waiting, and things go quite smoothly, and patients do very, very well. Then I uh, think about the last question we'll have time for is Cindy Bonzo, who is the director of our Children's Heart Project at uh, Samaritan's Purse, mm -hmm. uh, is curious, and she says, what types of congenital heart repair can now be routinely done at Tenwick when your visiting team is not there? So routinely they can do um, the heart valve repairs, which are the bulk of the surgeries um, that need to be done. As I said, there's a huge burden of rheumatic heart disease, so aortic valve repla replacement, mitral valve replacement, those can be done when we're not there, particularly in older children. And generally the children who require those surgeries are in the you know 10 plus years of age. Many, many young adults that need that operation, um, and those can be done when we're not there. Um, certainly some more straightforward types of operations for congenital defects like an atrial septal defect or um, a patent ductus arteriosus ligation. That's an extra vessel that can be tied off. Those types of things can easily be done when we're not there. Um, and now that they've learned some of the perfusion techniques, they can start start caring for smaller patients and doing um, more some of the more simple um, ASD or VSD type repairs, but for the most part the congenital, um, largely because of the perioperative care, not just the operation itself, but the complexities of what can happen after surgery and some of the complications that need to be addressed. Um, in general, they save those for us when we get there or for one of the other teams that might be visiting. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mary. You know, I hope you don't mind me addressing you as Mary. Uh, no, uh, okay, okay. Um, I have a son uh, that is uh, Dr. Patrick Wood, who is a uh, a uh, family practice doctor with a specialty in fibromyalgia, who practices there in town with you. So. Oh, that's awesome. You might look him up. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, if you mind, I'm going to close this real quick in prayer, and then I've got some, I uh, want everybody to stick around. We've got a couple of reminders for you before we sign off. Uh, Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for Mary, uh, for Dr. Taylor, Lord, for her training, uh, for the team that she's able to put together, and for the good that they do, Lord, to the glory of your kingdom. Uh, we ask that all of that continue, uh, that it go well, and we give you that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I do want to remind you, okay. I do want to remind uh, those that are listening uh, that there is CME credit available for this session. Uh, the form and instructions are in your email, and we'll be sending a follow-up email with a link to this uh, with the recording. Uh, if you're not on our email list, there's a link below uh, this video uh, to sign up. And I want to remind everybody that our next webinar will be Wednesday, June 8th, with Dr. Phil Fisher. He'll present on common forms of pediatric uh, malnutrition, and uh, we uh, hope to see you then. And so with that, we'll sign off and say thank you very much for, for listening in and uh, look forward to the next one. Uh, thank you. <laughs>